Jason with uh, him all over the news these days with talk of the fiscal cliff looming. But first I want to introduce our chairman, Charles Jensen, our founder of Politics on the Rocks. Since 05, POTR has grown to be the largest political networking group in the state. And of course, headed up by Charles Jensen. Uh, he got his start in politics by running for uh, student government at ASU. That of course led to him working in the presidential motorcade and secret service with President Bush. He's now served as a vice president of a leading financial institution. And of course, he uh, spends his time, all free time, putting together events for us like this. So with that, I'd like to introduce Charles Jensen. How's everyone doing tonight? Paul's doing an introduction on my like, who is this guy? He sounds pretty cool. That's just me. Well, I want to welcome you all tonight. We got a special event here. Uh, this is our 64th event over a, a five year uh, monthly event kind of structure. Just want to welcome a couple people here. We have uh, Barry Goldwater Jr. Barry, where are you at? Somewhere over there. Oh, right in the back, hand up. Red Star, that's Barry. He's kind of a big deal in town. Uh, really nice guy and a really, really great mentor as well. We have the students from Liberty here. Uh, also, we have the college Republicans here as well. Hopefully I'm not drinking. That'd be bad. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, Billmore Graphics, they do all our printing. Uh, Scottsdale Knights, they own a transportation company now and providing all our transportation today. And they do a lot of the, the club promotion in the area. I'd uh, like to think, think uh, who else we got here? Swiss America. Here's the funny thing. Swiss America was supposed to speak today, but literally, since Obama got reelected, they have so many gold orders, they couldn't even leave the building. Literally. 6,000 new leads as soon as Obama got elected. So they're here, but they're not here. And we do have a couple representatives here. Uh, David, where are you at? Well, he's here somewhere uh, with Swiss America, so we appreciate them being here today. Also, we have our photographer, Brian Kelly, here doing amazing work. You're going to be a great photographer, Brian Kelly. Now, I'm going to do something we haven't really done before, and I'll try to do this quick. By a raise of hands, who in here would like to either a book sign and a picture of Grover Norquist? Raise your hands. We're taking a vote here. Okay, well, that's pretty unanimous. That looks pretty good. So here's what we're going to do. As soon as Grover finishes speaking, we're going to start a line going this way, down the aisle right here coming up this side of the stage and coming off this side of the stage. But this can only happen if we go very quickly. So get the book signed, we'll keep conversations down as much as we can. We get into fiscal cliff discussions and that could go for about an hour at least. So we gotta watch out for that. Anyways, it's great to have all of you here tonight. We do have a, a raffle here. Do you all see the guitar on stage? You probably thought I was going to play this thing. Actually, I do play guitar. But uh, it's, signed by the, it's signed by the band Train. And this is part of our Scottsdale Healthcare Military Partnership. And you all saw the van outside? What they, what they do is they train doctors how to work on uh, uh, vets, people wounded, um, you know, uh, explosions, gunshots, stuff like that. So this is a really good charity. All the money goes to charity. It's uh, $10 for one ticket. $20 for three tickets, the odds are pretty good because it only, it's only to me, well, how did you get your speaker? How did that person come to town? This year, in this room right here, for those who have been following our group, we've hosted Michelle Bachman, Grover Norquist, uh, Grover obviously, Newt Gingrich, Vice President Dan Quell. We've had some amazing speakers. Grover's story is very interesting. Uh, I met him about five years ago. I was at an organization of uh, an event called CPAC, a lot of you know it out in DC. And I ran to Patrick Gleason, who was a Grover. And he invited me over to Grover's house, he had a little get together. Um, and he's a person that brings people into his house. He's a great networker. This guy runs a policy networking group in almost what, 44 states, if not 48 states now. For a while, be 57 states. But 48 is good enough, right? And just a great networker. And we have a lot in common in a lot of ways. And it's my pleasure to introduce Grover Norquist today. Let me tell you a little bit about him first. Who here has seen him on the news in the last couple of weeks? Just about all of you, right? I'm in the gym at nighttime and I see all the little news, media. I can see like MSNBC, Grover, CNN, Grover, Fox News, Grover. He's everywhere right now, which is really neat. Now, he runs Americans for Tax Reform. It was founded by Grover Norquist in 1985 at the request of President Ronald Reagan. 
America's Tax Reform is a coalition of taxpayer groups, individuals, and businesses opposed to higher taxes at the federal, state, and local levels. ATR organizes a taxpayer protection pledge which asks all candidates on the federal and state office to commit themselves in writing to oppose all tax increases. In the 112 Congress, 238 House members, 41 senators have taken the pledge. On the state level, 13 governors and 1,244 state legislatures have taken the pledge. In the words of Newt Gingrich, Grover Dorcas is the person who regards as the most innovative, creative, and courageous entrepreneurial person in America. He has truly made a difference and truly changed American history. Mr. Dorcas holds a Master's of Business Administration and a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Economics, both from Harvard University. He currently lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Samuel, and his daughters, Grace and Giselle. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you one of the most brilliant and connected people in the nation, Grover Norquist. Okay. Now, there are two teams in American politics. Now, there have always been two parties, but for a long time that didn't mean very much. If somebody told you they were Republican 30, 40, 50 years ago, you knew they were born north of the Mason-Dixon line and nothing else. There were lots of Democrats, little old ladies living in Mississippi who were Democrats and believed everything Ronald Reagan believed and they voted for George McGovern because Sherman was mean to Atlanta recently. <laughs> this is not the way to pick up teams if you're trying to run the most powerful, important, successful country in the world. And so during the lifetime of Ronald Reagan, we sorted things out in a rather reasonable way. Those of us who wanted limited constitutional government became Republicans. Those people who wanted unlimited European social welfare state government became Democrats. Uh, and we now have two parties that make sense. Every once in a while, some of our guys surprise us unpleasantly. Never are we surprised pleasantly by the other team. But uh, we're working on that subject, on both of those. And those are the two teams. People want less government, people want more. You may have noticed that in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of whining about all this, you know, not uh, partisan bickering. Why don't we have bipartisan compromise? Well, of course, what they miss is in the good old days, in their mind, everything was bipartisan because Richard Nixon, who wanted bigger government, could get together with Teddy Kennedy, who wanted really bigger government, and they could compromise on somewhat bigger government. Because they were both moving in the same direction, it was just a question of how quickly they were there. Well, today we actually have a modern Republican Party that wants a smaller, more efficient, but smaller and less intrusive government, and Obama and Reid and Pelosi, who want a significantly larger government in every way. And so you don't have compromise. If somebody wants to go east and the other person wants to go west, what would a compromise look like? What do they mean when they talk about compromising between two people going in different directions? So what we need to do is figure out, I'm all in favor of compromising on the road to liberty. I like to go very quickly to limited government, and I realize there's some people pulling in the other direction. So if we only go part of the way this year, that's a compromise. But look, if you're here in, if you're in Boston and you're trying to get to California and you show up in Missouri, that's not treason. You're on the way to California. But if your feet are wet and the people around you are speaking French, you have not been compromising, you've been moving in the wrong direction, okay? So, they keep, the Democrats and the press keep telling us we should compromise, when what they really mean is we should lose, okay? I'm all in favor of compromising as much as we have to, and no more, on the road to liberty. I'm never in favor of losing. So, in Washington, D.C., we have a Republican House, Democrat Senate, Democrat President, and we have gridlock on a lot of issues, which is a big improvement over where we were three years ago, where we were moving as far and as fast as we could to sh become California or Greece, okay? So gridlock is an improvement over moving in the wrong direction. So a lot of fights in D.C., back and forth. Uh, they can't pass any bills the House doesn't agree to, but we can't pass anything that the Senate won't do or the President might veto, so we're not going to make a lot of progress at the national level. 
At the state level, however, we have exactly the opposite situation. 24 states have a Republican governor and a Republican legislature. I'm in one of them. 14 states have a Democrat governor and a Democrat legislature. So 24 states, if the Republicans get together, they can turn their state into Hong Kong or Texas as quickly as they want to. Okay? So there's no reason not to get moving faster in Arizona. And in 14 states, California, Illinois, and Maryland, Vermont, if the Democrats get together, since they have the governor in both houses, they can move and become California or Greece as quickly as they wish to. So we're going to see what works. We're going to experiment at the state level. Okay? We'll let Vermont try things out and see if they work before anybody else does that next. Uh, I think it's unnecessary to try this out on a state as large as California, and that's unfortunate. But California, look, nobody's life is a complete waste. Some people serve as bad examples. That's California. Okay. So you can say to small children and neighbors, don't do that, okay, and then plan accordingly. Now, in Washington, D.C., we're up against the fiscal cliff, tax Mageddon, uh, and on, on January 1st, a series of things happen, and if you get your news from CBS, you can get confused because they kind of conflate them. One, all of the Bush tax cuts disappear, okay? There's a, on January 1st, if nothing happens, there's a $500 billion, with a B, billion dollar tax increase that takes effect in 2000. There's a sequester of $100 billion a year in spending, so spending will not rise as fast as Obama wanted if the sequester is allowed to kick in. Big surprise, Obama wants to end the sequester and spend a trillion and a half dollars more over the next decade than present law. Now this one, we just have to sit on our hands and the money gets saved, okay? We don't have to pass a new bill to stop the savings, uh, uh, to make the savings take place. Third, and this is the one they never talk about on national TV, 90% of the tax increases to fund Obamacare, which oddly enough, you may not be aware, was not for free. They kind of sold it as if it was free, but it wasn't for free. There's a trillion dollars plus tax increase over the next decade for Obamacare, and somebody wisely decided that 90% of the tax hike would show up after Obama was safely reelected. Okay, comrades, this was not a coincidence. Uh, this was done on purpose. So we're going to have this massive set of tax increases that happen automatically. This is law of the land. We don't have to pass another bill. This just happens to us. So three big changes in January, and now we're in the middle of a fight, a negotiation to see whether we can stop the bad stuff and encourage the good stuff moving forward. It now looks as though President Obama intends to push us all off the fiscal cliff, to raise taxes on everybody, to have the Obamacare taxes take effect, and he would like to pull back on the spending restraint. I'm not quite sure how he's going to do that, but that's on his list of things to do. How do we know he wants us to go over the fiscal cliff? Well, he came and said, here's my budget deal. This is his offer to negotiate with uh, the Republicans in the House and the Senate. His budget, which he presented a year ago for 213, is basically his negotiation. It includes some savings. He saves $800 billion by not continuing to be in Iraq for the next 10 years. Okay? which we weren't planning to do anyway. Uh, I thought we could save a lot more if we'd agreed not to continue the War of 1812 for the next decade. Um, and I think we could save a lot of money that way. This is the lack of seriousness on Obama's part. Um, he also saves money by counting budget cuts the Republicans won two years ago and are the law of the land allowing those to happen because it's the law of the land. He wants to count that as a trillion dollar uh, contribution to spending restraint. It's not a serious budget. He wants $1.6 trillion in higher taxes on everybody. And we're going to have a knockdown drag out. Now, the reason we're going over a fiscal cliff is because he believes he has a mandate from heaven or something where he's allowed to do anything he wants. 
And why do we think that this is the way he's approaching life? We'll look back four years. Four years ago, he won the presidency. Then he won with a large margin against a war hero, Senator McCain. And he said, well, now I'm in charge. I get to run everything. And he hadn't quite mentioned the $800 billion stimulus plan during the campaign, but his view was, since he was elected, everything that he was secretly for, we'd endorse. So I put the $800 billion spending on the table, a trillion dollar spending increase on other stuff, um, uh, taxes on energy, Obamacare, everything came out, and within five months, his 70% approval rating dropped below 50, the Tea Party 1.0 came into being, the Republicans took the House of Representatives away from the Democrats, strengthened in the Senate, and he was put back on his heels. Now, we've got Obama 2.0. He gets elected again. Now, how did he win? He won by hiding his agenda. He won because 86% of his TV ads, he spent hundreds of millions of dollars on television ads, 86% were to tell you that Mitt Romney causes cancer and other stuff, okay? He ran personal attacks on Romney. He won a very strong mandate for the next four years to not be Mitt Romney. He did not win a mandate to raise taxes to spend more money and to continue his job killing policies because he didn't mention those in the ads and he didn't really mention them in his talks. But he's now convinced that he can do anything he wants just like four years ago. But there's a difference. Four years ago, he spent too much and the Tea Party rose up. Four years ago, he hadn't raised taxes yet. Four years ago, he didn't have masses of regulations weighing down the economy. Now, as we go into the next four years, every one of the ugly bits of Obamacare, the taxes, the regulations, the taxes that will destroy your health savings account, your flexible savings account, the $20 billion of taxes on medical devices like stents and prosthetic devices and, and uh, heart stuff for, you know, the medical devices, pacemakers, thank you. Um, somebody's got one. Uh, $20 billion taxes on raising the cost of all those things as part of his effort to make health care more affordable for everybody, okay? Um, all of that stuff happens over the next four years. Add to that all the regulations that they didn't share with you before the election. Now, can you imagine them sitting in the White House going, here's a regulation, here's what it costs, here's what it's supposed to do, and Obama says, do that one after the election. Why do you think he decides to have that take effect after the election? If it was going to be useful and helpful and everyone would look at it and go, oh my goodness, that regulation will make us healthy and prosperous and it helps almost nothing, they would have done it a while ago. Only the ugly regulations, the costly ones, the ones that make no sense, have been delayed until after the election. The next four years, there's no hidden good news. There's only bad news for the economy. And the reason why Obama's going to take us over the fiscal cliff is so that when we hit all of the lousy economy that he's laid out like a dinner table for us over the next four years, he will turn around because he got tired of blaming Bush for his first four years, and he'll blame the Republican Congress and going over the, the, the fiscal cliff for the, the bad economy that he's already set in place in motion that we're going to go through. We have tough four years, but two years from now we have to take the Senate back. Four years from now we elect the president. And here's the good news. We actually have a plan to turn this all around. It's called the Paul Ryan Plan. It takes the 185 different welfare programs in Washington and it block grants them to the states so that the red states can run them well and the blue states can have fun spending all the money. Uh, and it takes Medicare and saves it from going bankrupt by reforming it to keep costs down from competition, not from rationing. The only savings in Obamacare comes from rationing. And it's the one thing they don't want to talk about because it's ugly and it's not pleasant and it doesn't work well in Europe or Canada. So we're going to move forward. We just need to get ourselves a Senate to go along with the House, a president that can work with them, and I wish we were doing this starting this January, but it's going to take us four years. Arizona.